Welcome to APUSH. Today we're going to discuss the rise of big business conglomerations known as trusts. So take a brief moment and make sure you understand clearly your objectives here, and then we'll dive in and get to some specifics. So the rise of the trusts is a period in the Gilded Age in which we see the big business conglomerations that we sort of discussed earlier grow in size and scope. And so we're going to get into detail with some detail with some of the guys who built these large corporations. Uh, they're collectively known as captains of industry or robber barons, depending on how you feel about them. And so we'll introduce some of our main players and talk about the business, the industries they monopolized and how they got so powerful. So that brings us first to the railroad trusts. Railroads were one of the first uh, industries to be monopolized, and it was obviously railroads are relatively difficult to start, and they require a lot of capital. And so uh, they, uh, and as they grew in size and started developing and getting certain, basically uh, perks or. Um, so if you had access to, for example, refrigerated rail cars or Pullman sleeping cars or some of these um, some of these new technological improvements, you could quickly run your competitors out of business by offering a significantly higher quality service. You would then, of course, buy out their infrastructure. And once you started to build a relatively large railroad system, you could then force your competitors out of business by undercutting them on specific routes. And before you know it, you had a variety of different railroad barons who had more or less divided up the country between them, coming up with sort of a tacit understanding to not compete with each other over to not compete with each other and to just dominate their various areas. The most famous of these, of course, was Cornelius Vanderbilt, who we see here carving up the Northeast. But all of these guys were relatively important within different parts of the country. So the problem with this, of course, is as these businesses monopolize, they can, of course, charge whatever prices that they want. And farmers specifically and Westerners start to feel like they're being squeezed out by these massive Eastern corporations who can more or less run roughshod over them. Because, of course, if you want goods shipped into the West or to ship your products to market, you're pretty dependent on these railroads and, in general, pretty dependent on, it, on one specific railroad system. So, for example, this is the New York Central Railroad, which dominated uh, the sort of lower Great Lakes industrial region. And, of course, they could, if any competitor tried to compete with them, they would just simply undercut them on that specific route, being able to make up the distance, uh, the difference on any of their other routes. And so as they became the only game in town, they could cut deals with large manufacturers and basically, you know, monopolize Tra rail travel in the Northeast, which was incredibly important and very lucrative. Even in the West, you saw some of this happening. Uh, obviously, in Kansas here, we see multiple different railroads. But if you think about, like, if you live in Wichita, you really only have one option here, right? If you're not on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, you're not effectively able to get your goods to market. And so in the West, this monopolization was especially acute and uh, was really a problem for a lot of Western ranchers, farmers, and manufacturers to the extent that there were any. Then you've got the then you've got the production of steel next. The Bessemer process or Bessemer pro I, I really should figure out how to pronounce that. Uh, making steel really seems like magic to me. So you'll have to ask your science teachers about the specific details. But apparently it's lighter and more flex flexible, and you use like air and then carbon to make this anyway. So um, the effect of this, of course, is because it's lighter and more durable, it breaks less easily. You know, used in railroads, farm equipment, canned goods, and skyscrapers. As these buildings, because they were lighter, could be significantly taller. And so this steel boom led to a massive increase in uh, construction across the United States. The guy most responsible for pioneering this process is Andrew Carnegie. The Carnegie Steel Corporation of Ohio uh, was able to create uh, some of the highest quality steel in the United States by the process of vertical integration. We talked about vertical integration before, but for Carnegie, this basically means that he's buying uh, he's buying up iron mines in northern Minnesota. He then buys up ore boats to ship the ore across the Great Lakes, and he's got his own steel refining business, specifically in Cleveland and Youngstown, Ohio, as we sort of see down here in the corner. 
And so by monopolizing the entire production chain, he can produce much higher quality steel at a lower price and can start to drive his competitors out of business. Eventually, Carnegie Steel was incorporated into U.S. Steel, which became the main steel trust and um, monopoly steel company. Uh, you might recognize U.S. Steel based because of their logo is still used for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And obviously, U.S. Steel was based in Pittsburgh. U.S. Steel was created by J.P. Morgan, who started out in banking and then quickly was able to use his banking largesse to create a massive portfolio of a variety of different industries, which he then monopolized. He's kind of our captain of industry slash robber baron par excellence. And here in this awesome political cartoon, we show the relative power of J.P. Morgan to the monarchs of old Europe. J.P. Morgan would then buy, would buy out these failing companies and then, and then put high, uh, highly skilled people in charge in order to make them profitable again. And so he would then use the, build this massive portfolio and use the, uh, the proceeds of that to continue to build his empire. So he basically went to Andrew Carnegie with a blank check and was able to simply, uh, you know, basically tell Carnegie to think of the largest number he could. And then he purchased Carnegie Steel for that number. He was able to consolidate Carnegie Steel with all these other steel companies to become U.S. Steel. And, of course, the steel uh, manufacturing hub of the United States here in western uh, Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio. And so he created this massive conglomeration that uh, monopolized the steel industry. There was also consolidation within energy companies, specifically as we started switching from coal to oil. Coal, oil obviously requires significantly more infrastructure to process than coal does. And so you started to see monopolization in this industry because, of course, specialized processes lead to people who can streamline that process, being able to drive competitors out of business. Whereas with coal, it's more like, can you get the coal from the ground and ship it to someone? So Standard Oil which was founded by, you, you might recognize, of course, the logo of Standard Oil. Standard Oil, which was founded by John D. Rockefeller, became the, uh, monopoly, the, monopoly, the, the mono oil monopoly. <laughs> and uh, by using horizontal integration, Rockefeller was able to buy out all the other or a significant portion of his competitors, becoming the, one of the only oil refineries in the United States. And so by owning 90% of the oil refineries, he was then able to drive competitors out of business through price discrimination. And then he would buy them out and add them to his growing empire. So Standard Oil is, again, our, um, our, one of our prototypical monopolies. Here is a political cartoon showing the, large, the effect of Standard Oil, obviously being able to crush the public here and with its tentacles moving out towards the White House. And we'll spend more time talking about uh, the effect of big business on politics in future lectures. But just know that these, these captains of industry are going to start donating large amounts of money to political campaigns. And, of course, they're going to expect favors and uh, you know, regulations to be applied somewhat liberally to them because of this. And so, obviously, massive effect. Electricity also shows up during this time period. Uh, I wish we had time to talk more about Thomas Edison and his uh, consolidation of uh, inventors in his Menlo Park laboratory and his awesome battle with, uh, with Tesla. But Edison is going to be the guy, one of the, one of the guys who helps create electricity and creates the Edison Electric Company, which is then, of course, purchased by J.P. Morgan, who we see here attempting to hit a photographer with his cane. And so J.P. Morgan is going to buy out Edison's company and turn it into this massive monopoly known as General Electric. I'm not going to get into the whole uh, Tesla, the currency wars and Tesla versus Edison for the, the difference between alternating current and direct current. Uh, I, from my understanding, alternating current is somewhat safer. And so we ended up going with AC over DC. And uh, General Electric would, uh, of course, build all this infrastructure and um, create... Uh, access to electricity for people, which obviously electricity is much more flexible and safe than uh, you know, using heating oil or things like that. So, And Edison is also known for pioneering, of course, the light bulb, which the light bulb utterly transforms urban life by allowing people to be out much later and uh, you know, allowing cities to be much more brightly lit.
you know, creating more opportunities to be productive in the evening and also, you know, safer, you know, so you're not getting like running into things, you're getting robbed or stuff like that. And then, of course, we start we start to see electricity powering vehicles. We get the rise of streetcars and more effective mass trans transport, which, of course, allows people to live further outside the city center and allows cities to continue to grow. As we said before, General Electric becomes the uh, monopoly, the J.P. Morgan's electric monopoly. Uh, you might recognize uh, the GE logo here. And so they're going to control almost 100% of the electrical production in the Northeast. And in a variety of states, there's this battle over utilities like electricity. Should we allow private companies to run them or should we take over them as a state? Because as electricity becomes absolutely essential, the danger of allowing private companies to run for-profit businesses becomes apparent to people. And so this is a battle that happens all across the country. And honestly, we're still struggling with it today. Uh, West Star is uh, technically a state sanctioned monopoly. And in order for them to raise your electric rates, they have to get approval from the state legislature because we understand that electricity is absolutely essential to the way that we live. We also get the ma a massive rise of consumer goods during this time period as more people have more money. And so I'm just throwing this out there, you know, to tack it on to the rise of the trusts. But know that the idea of brand name products starts to happen because as people, uh, as the shipping infrastructure and the retail infrastructure grows, you have more options. And so uh, how do you pick between a variety of totally identical oats? Well, you want to obviously you want to buy the one with uh, William Penn's face on it, right? Because they're they make the best porridge, quote unquote. And William Penn's trustworthy, right? You should totally buy his oats. Of course, we also get advances in medicine during this time period. And so um, in order to improve people's lives, we start seeing, uh, you know, additives being added to products and, of course, advertising, uh, you know, instantaneous cures to things, which, you know, I, I imagine it would be. And uh, the Sears and Roebuck catalog greatly uh, increases people's access to goods. Uh, this mail order catalog was the Amazon of its day in that you would, uh, you know, mail the order your uh, whatever you wanted to uh, the, the central Sears site. And, you know, if you wanted whether you wanted a fancy hat or a chandelier or a gun or a carriage or, you know, whatever the heck this thing is, you'd send in your order and you would now have access to goods that you could only have dreamt of only a few years before. And so you see a massive expansion of consumer goods and the rise of department stores. Uh, we really, department stores are sort of going away, but stores like Wanamaker's and Macy's show up, these sort of massive showrooms where you could go around and look at slash try out a variety of different types of items and then, you know, buy them in one convenient place. So obviously we're starting to pander to consumer tastes here. And finally, you get the justification for all of this. Uh, the two concepts that you need to be familiar with are one, the gospel of wealth, and two, social Darwinism. So let's talk through these two somewhat complementary and somewhat contrasting ideas. The gospel of wealth is, was articulated by Andrew Carnegie, who basically argued that wealthy people have the responsibility to distribute their wealth back to the people. And so he, of course, gave tons of money to libraries and public universities. And he basically argued, his argument was that this, this benefits society more than if the wealth was distributed to individuals. Because wealthy people are so wealthy, they can do larger things with their wealth that push societies forward. And so the massive consolidation of wealth in a few people is a good thing for society. So in his book, The Gospel of Wealth, he laid out this philosophy. On the other hand, you have the idea of social Darwinism, which is the idea that you take the sort of a natural belief of survival of the fittest and you just apply it to businesses and individuals. So why is Standard Oil a monopoly that controls 90% of the oil processing in the country? Because they do it better than anyone else does. And so this is a natural process and should not be resisted. And uh, by resisting it, you're basically propping up inferior companies who provide inferior products. And if you really want to challenge standard oil, you should just become better at oil refining. So these two philosophies combine together to justify the massive wealth accrued by these robber barons slash captains of industry. 
and and of course that the yeah to justify big business in general the idea of uh, your own individual skill leading to success also moves into literature and so we get a lot of uh, American publications that basically focus on the idea that by going out and working hard, you could, you true too can become successful like Carnegie. You know, Carnegie worked as a mail clerk and then became this massive industrialist. Rockefeller went from rags to riches. And so you too, you know, you too can leave the farm, go to the big city, and then, you know, based on your own skill, become incredibly rich. Uh, Horatio Alger wrote, wrote like a hundred different books with exactly this same theme. And uh, so you'll be reading an excerpt from one of his books in, your one, in some of your documents for today. So this brings us back to our central questions. Uh, make sure you can provide somewhat detailed answers to these. And then we'll be back to talk about the political fallout from all this stuff. <laughs>